And I realized that I wasn't just being thrown to the wolves, I was being fed to the wolves. A new symptom has been added to the Monty Shit Show disease, nausea. In this episode, it was all about how hard she tried, how hard she tried to make it work, how all she ever wanted to do was fit in with the royal family and give Archie the childhood that she was never blessed with. Because remember, she has no family to speak of after all. That's why it was just her mom at the wedding. Regardless, no matter how hard she tried, nothing she did was ever good enough. We finally touch upon that letter that she wrote her father in that fancy handwriting that no one was meant to see back in August of 2018. Apparently it all came about when the royal family had enough of Thomas Markle making all these TV appearances and interviews and the royal family was embarrassed and so Meghan sought the Queen's guidance and asked her, what do you want me to do? I want to make like whatever advice you have. It was suggested by the Queen, the Prince of Wales, that I write my dad a letter. Right, because it was the Queen whose Instagram bio had lover of a handwritten note on it and not Megan's. Now, in case you're not familiar with Revenge, Tom Bauer's book and the alternate version, which I like to call the truth, the Queen and Charles actually tried to convince Megan to go see her father. In fact, the palace tried to get Meghan to go see her father before her wedding. Now, Meghan's reasons for cutting out her father are unknown to us, but we can only guess that it's the same reason that she cuts out everyone who knows her, because she has this narrative that she sold to Harry, and by extension, the rest of the royal family, which doesn't line up with the truth. And so if anyone like Thomas Markle joined the fray, she'd be exposed. So seeing him and patching things up was never on the agenda for Meghan. I actually made a couple of videos defending Meghan and this entire letter copyright privacy lawsuit. Now, ironically, the reason I made the video was because I was asked to in my capacity as a lawyer, and I agreed with Justice Warby's judgment, not knowing anything about Meghan and her background. But let me tell you about the timeline of what happened. Thomas received the letter in August of 2018. The letter wasn't leaked until several months later in 2019, I believe early 2019, after Meghan's five anonymous friends decided to stand up for her and defend her in that notorious People magazine article where they also happened to attack Thomas Markle's character. So you tell me, what do you believe? Do you believe that Thomas randomly decided to leak the letter several months after he received it and held on to it, he kept it private for absolutely no reason? Or is it more likely that he did it after he was so ruthlessly attacked as a right of response? I know which version I believe, but you can let me know in the comments. And for someone who always claims that she is so intelligent and she's such a nerd, didn't she know that a handwritten letter sent from the Duchess of Sussex had the potential to be leaked? whether it was intercepted, whether it was never actually delivered to her father, all of these things, because she went through this diversion to get it to Thomas. She sent it to LA first, according to her. So how could she have known for certain that it wouldn't have been leaked by someone at some point? Now, I'm not saying that's what happened. Thomas Markle admitted to giving it to the mail so that they could help him in his right of response, but there were many risks along the way, and she's pretending that it was so shocking that the letter was leaked. If you truly wanted to maintain your privacy, you could have gone to see him like the queen asked you to, urged you to, or you could have picked up the phone and talked to him. He's always maintained, Thomas Markle, that he's got the same number. So why does she resort to a fancy handwritten letter? Well, the short answer is that she wanted her father to leak the letter. She allegedly devised a plan with those five anonymous friends to put out this hit piece in People magazine. And it's funny, Abigail Spencer says in one of the episodes, I called one of my closest friends who just so happened at the time to be the editor of People magazine. So they devised that plan when Thomas didn't leak the letter to force him to leak it. And apparently, if you believe that version, he took the bait. Now this lawsuit with the Daily Mail, which Megan decided to take on by herself, no one forced her to do it, in fact she pushed for it, was seen as the catalyst for everything going wrong and everything going downhill 
with the royal family and the palace. Now I've covered the lawsuit in quite a bit of detail, including the appeal. So I'm not gonna be doing that in this video. I'm sure we all know the gist. She ended up winning the privacy and copyright claims. Enter Jenny Afia or Afia. This lawyer who worked for Johnny Depp, by the way, and you all know I have fought incredibly tirelessly to help clear Johnny's name ever since 2020. It's actually how I started my channel properly. And Jenny's name came up quite a bit as someone who worked for Johnny Depp. His law firm was Shillings. So to see her in action and to hear her say ridiculous things such as... I've certainly seen evidence that there was negative briefing from the palace against Harry and Meghan to suit other people's agendas. Was really disappointing and confusing because as a lawyer, she should know saying you have the evidence or you've seen it isn't enough. And the irony of highlighting this witness statement as a statement of truth, when we know that Meghan Markle herself in 2021 was outed for misleading the court of appeal in connection to this very litigation. So clearly statements of truth mean nothing to these types of people. And since Meghan and Harry and Netflix don't know how to make a documentary, here is the other side presented by a letter from Jason Knopf to the High Court in connection with this litigation. To summarize, Jason stated that the palace did indeed go through great lengths to protect not only Meghan's privacy and reputation, but that of her parents as well. And unlike Meghan, Jason provides evidence of this assistance, which dates back to as far as November 2016, when that now notorious statement was issued condemning the allegedly racist and sexist coverage of Meghan. He provides more details of this assistance, so you can go ahead and pause the screen if you want to read this letter in more detail, but I thought it would be only fair to present the other side rather than just let Meghan and Harry continue spewing their one-sided propaganda. Meghan and Harry use a Daily Mail lawsuit, which they voluntarily and vigorously pursued as the reason why they chose to spend Christmas of 2019 in Canada rather than with the rest of the family. So they were escaping a monster of their own creation, essentially. We thought it would be good to give ourselves some breathing space. You guys can be on the front pages of all the papers. You have it exactly the way you want it. If you want us to go and do things on behalf of the Queen, we'll go and do it and we'll pay for it ourselves. If this wasn't gonna work out, then we would be willing to relinquish our Sussex titles if need be. Apparently, Meghan was meant to be a part of the Sandringham Summit, but the palace refused to grant them that meeting until Meghan left for Canada. First of all, why did Meghan go back to Canada? They say it's because Archie was left behind, to which I ask, why did you leave your newborn baby behind? But secondly, assuming that's true, I honestly can't say I blame the royal family. By then, they would have dealt with Meghan long enough to know that she was in Harry's ear. She was his evil advisor. She was his Jafar. Now, Tom Bauer's version is that she basically ditched Harry and left him to deal with this mess all by himself. Regardless, we all know what happened then. This half in, half out nonsense was rejected by the queen because Harry would like to have us believe that the queen is some kind of a puppet. I'm now told that you're busy. She goes, yes, I didn't know that I was busy. I've been told that I'm busy. I've actually been told that I'm busy all week. I mean, talk about misogyny. Tom Bauer actually goes into a lot of detail into the terms or the demands, I suppose, that Meghan and Harry presented. And a lot of these demands involved merching. And I'm talking selling pens, notepads, you know, sticking on that Sussex Royal title all over it. Of course the queen rejected it. And if William actually yelled at Harry, which by the way, I have siblings, oh my God, newsflash. Siblings yell at each other. And Harry used that by the way, to imply that William bullied them out of the royal family because when a joint statement that he apparently never agreed to was released denying these claims, Harry was shocked. I couldn't believe it. No one asked me permission to put my name to a statement like that. Thereby implying that it was true that his brother bullied them out of the royal family. At this point, I seriously had to hit pause and get up and just, you know, collect myself because as someone who's been covering these two for almost two years now, it is so rich of a man who shares his bed with a woman who has been accused of bullying by multiple PAs and employees, multiple witnesses to back them up. And she hasn't sued Valentine Lowe yet. And he has the audacity to imply his brother is a bully when his brother, the future king, 
was the one who consoled these PAs and other members of staff. And then he took a stand for them when he finally said, enough is enough. And we all know what happens when you tell Meghan Markle that you don't like something she did or she has to stop doing something, even if it's bullying, she declares war. It's just like that member of the public who chastised her for mistreating her father. If you point out her misdeeds, it is over. It is annihilation. Now we get to Meghan and Harry's specialty, misinformation. They open up this segment with this scene of Harry doing a Zoom call and calling misinformation global humanitarian crisis. Yeah, of which you and your wife are at the helm. I mean, seriously, man, you have the audacity to talk about this after what you and your wife have said in the Oprah interview and many interviews after that. Really? Your lies have been debunked. You couldn't even tell the truth about when you got married. Now, this Bot Sentinel report uncovered that there are 83 accounts on Twitter that are orchestrating this coordinated, deeply networked attack against Meghan Markle. And they have a reach of 17 million people. They were actively recruiting people, telling people how to create multiple accounts. Where is the evidence of this call to arms? And of course, they had to bring out the race card again. I mean, it wouldn't be a Meghan and Harry episode without the race card. It's all they've got. These are housewives. These are middle-aged Caucasian women. Candace Owens, who I have to admit I don't watch, but is a black woman based in America who is very anti Meghan and Harry. They chose to leave her out. Scores of young women in their 20s, like myself, who are not necessarily white, they chose to leave us out. Why? Because it doesn't fit the narrative. They cherry picked influencers and decided to label them all as angry, middle aged white women. I mean, talk about stereotypes. Oh, wait, sorry, sorry. Archetypes. My bad. I've actually looked at this Bot Sentinel report when it was first released uh, a year ago at this point. There were a few nasty, hateful tweets about the way Megan looks and some tweets that use derogatory language, which I will never condone. However, most of these tweets were actually just valid criticism, criticizing her behavior and not her race. Because believe it or not, when the whole world fell in love with her, like I said in the last episode for part four, she was still biracial. She didn't miraculously become a woman of color. So what they're putting forth here, what they're suggesting doesn't make sense. In fact, they actually play footage of UK based television shows defending Meghan after Megxit was announced. And guess what? A lot of them were white, middle-aged British women. And along the same vein, many young black women, for example, dislike Meghan and constantly call her out. None of this has anything to do with race or even gender, because Harry's really pushing this misogynistic agenda. It's misogyny at its best. The reason why people pin everything on Meghan and called it Megxit is because it didn't happen until she joined the fray. Before her, Harry spoke about how after therapy, he really found himself and found his place in the royal family and was looking forward to representing the interests of his grandmother. For me, it's a, an added member of the family. It's, a, it's, a, it's another, another team player as part of the, the bigger team. And you know, for all of us, all we want to do is be able to carry out um, the right engagements, carry out our work. And you still question why we think she was behind this entire thing and not you? And for the record, when I started my YouTube channel almost three years ago now in 2020, I received the most horrific form of bullying online that I had ever experienced because I decided to defend Johnny Depp. And you all know how the Sussex squad is. The Amber Heard stands are just as bad. I was called every horrific, nasty name under the sun. And the only thing you can do, the only thing I could do was ignore it. It's my real life. You are making people want to kill me. You are making me scared. Megan, you're not the only one going through this. And the only reason you're going through it on such an amplified scale is because you have amplified it. And also because it comes with the territory. You can't have the good without the bad. And you think that someone in her 20s doesn't have to say that to a seasoned Hollywood, Hollywood 41 year old actress who spent her entire life 
in LA, in Hollywood, in that scene, who actually craved it, who chased after that life. Believe it or not, they attacked William and Catherine's Caribbean tour, which was already marred in some controversy, although not as much as Meghan and Harry would like you to believe, because they were still very well received. Yes, there were a few hiccups, unfortunately, but they only highlight the negatives of that tour. To further this narrative that this colonial empire 2.0 needs to go away. And not only that, it really needs to go away now that Meghan Markle isn't a senior member of the royal family anymore. Because apparently the only reason that Commonwealth countries, the only benefit that they had was Meghan Markle. That's a perfect example of the palace not defending Catherine and William because these stories, they spread like wildfire. Why didn't the palace stifle these stories? I'll tell you why, because they can't. If they could, then Diana and Charles and Camilla and Sarah Ferguson and William and Catherine would have been protected. Oh, the delusion, the delusion. It's actually pathological. They actually need help. And Meghan more than Harry, because she actually came up with another scenario, which really reminded me of the Nelson Mandela comparison, you know? Oh, we rejoice in the streets when you were married. Whoever is sort of overseeing the crew, and he knelt next to my seat, and he took his hat off. And he goes, we appreciate everything you did for our country. And it was the first time that I felt like someone saw the sacrifice. It's comments like these from Megan that make me think that her issues are pathological. Because in her head, she somehow wants to be a martyr, a victim, and the heroine at the same time. It's like she wants people to believe that she is this survivor, this sacrificial lamb who did so much for a foreign country. I married a prince for you. I spent millions of pounds on clothing and jewelry and shoes every year for you. And I have something to say about this security argument where Harry essentially attacks his family for withdrawing security. First of all, you quit. So you don't get the perks and privileges and the benefits that come with a position that you voluntarily left. Second of all, you keep harping on about wanting to be normal. You've always just wanted to have this normal life, which, uh, newsflash Harry, we all don't live in 16 bathroom mansions and take private jets to polo matches every other week. And you know what else normal people don't have? Security. And my partner and I, we're one of those people. We've been stalked, harassed, physically assaulted. My partner was sexually assaulted on more than one occasion. And so when we walk out the door, we live in mortal fear every single time we leave the house. Now I know we're on the extreme end, but this is just one example of what us normals have to live with. I'm not saying you shouldn't get your own security with your own money, get it. But don't attack the palace, the institution, for taking away your security after you quit. Because you cannot, as you have been told by the Queen and William, and I'm sure Charles, have your royal cake and eat it too. But they're special. They're held to a different standard and they're never wrong. Most people need to find someone to blame. Yeah, Megan. And you're the epitome of most people. Peace.